Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we will have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Welcome or welcome back to this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series with Mark Resipsinski and I, Niels Castle larsen where each week we take the pulse of the global markets through the lens of a rules-based investor. Mark, wonderful to be back with you uh, this week. How are you doing? Good. Uh, I haven't talked to you since uh, last year, so Happy New Year. But I know. We're, already a, we're already a month into the year, surprisingly. <laughs> Yeah, we are indeed. Actually, we're recording on the first of February, uh, and uh, as people who have followed the uh, the last couple of weeks uh, episode, I'm actually recording this from a a hotel room in Miami since we have been uh, attending the the big conference week uh, for our industry uh, over here. So um, we got a. I mean, you provided some really really interesting topics, so uh, I'm, I appreciate that. Um, but before we go into any of that, of course. I'm always curious, uh, kind of what's been on your radar in the first month of the year? Anything uh, in particular that caught your interest? Well, what caught me my interest was what happened yesterday with the uh, Fed. Uh, we always are focused on Fed, and it's not so much the announcement, but it's uh, Jay Powell's press conference. And what we learned is is that they are dr uh, data-driven, which was, has been known for a long time, and we will lower rates when the data tells us to. And, they, and then people ask, of course, well, what does the data have to tell you to lower rates? And we'll say, we'll see. So, so this is the classic issue that we're facing right now with, uh, with the Fed is, is that they say, we're going to look at data. We're going to tell you that there are some data we're going to look at. But we're not going to tell you how we're going to interpret that data until after the fact, which is, frustrating because the the byword has been for the last decade or more is forward guidance that we're going to give you guidance of what we're going to do and uh, this is not good gu guidance when you think about it yeah no there were definitely some uh, how should i put it hopes that were dashed uh, yesterday when they came out and uh, of course which is a kind of a nice uh, leadway into the uh, trend following uh, side of things and 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 what's happened in in january um, I mean, yesterday uh, was certainly a give back day uh, uh, with all the reversals we saw in many of the uh, financial markets, uh, currencies, and and uh, and even energies. I guess so. Um, so yeah, m the month uh, is probably going to end uh, on a positive note. Uh, not as positive though as the numbers that I have from the day before, but uh, I think January will still come out uh, okay. And of course, it's only the first month uh, of the year. I think that um, when I just look at sort of the data that I have access to, uh, and I think this will be uh, relevant for uh, many trend followers and CTAs, uh, it really is that there were kind of three bright spots uh, in the month of January, and then there was just a lot of noise that didn't really do much uh, performance-wise. And the three bright spots um, were kind of in sectors that uh, yeah, we talk about them, but it's not that they are uh, on the front page uh, when we talk uh, performance attributions all the time. And and um, so uh, and what I mean by that is that within the equity sector, uh, of course, there has been a bit of a trend for a while now in Japanese equities, but they were very strong again in January, did very well for, for trend followers. And then on the short side, um, it was um, the Hang Seng. Uh, that really drove performance, while both sort of US, Europe probably didn't do so much for for our types of strategies uh, at the end of the month. Then there was another uh, interesting sector that provided some uh, good opportunities uh, to the downside, and that was the grain complex. I mean, grain markets have been moving lower for a while, uh, took a bit of a breather uh, toward the end of last year, and then 
kind of resumed their downtrend um, and for uh, perhaps managers with a slightly longer uh, holding period, that was uh, uh, a welcome uh, resumption of, of the downtrend. And then finally, uh, a market that uh, seems to continue uh, to just march uh, upwards, and that was Coco. Uh, it moved off 15% in uh, in January, and that's definitely a trend that I think uh, most trend followers uh, have been enjoying for for a while now, and that seems to continue a little bit uh, longer. Clearly, speed of systems uh, will have had an impact, and of course, as always, the markets we ha- have individually in our portfolios will have been also uh, impacting performance overall. My old trend barometer finished at 25. That suggests kind of a, a negative to flat uh, return. And I actually think that that's roughly where the industry is going to to come in, with exceptions, of course, on an individual manager basis. But as of Tuesday, so as of the 30th of January, uh, the beta 50 was up 1.56% for the month and the year. SockGen CT index up 1.53%. Um, the SockGen trend index up 1.63%, so very close, those three indices. And then the short-term traders index was actually down six basis points. Um, and we'll see. As I said yesterday, I think some of that performance will have been given back, uh, at least from for some of these indices. And then finally, as we always do, look at the uh, traditional markets. MSCI World Index ended up 1.14%. World Government Bond Index up 45 basis points. And finally, the S&P 500 up 1.65%. Now, Mark, we don't have any uh, questions that came in this week, um, so we're going to jump straight into a pretty long and interesting list of topics that you put together. So, uh, as I mentioned, I really appreciate uh, that. So why don't you uh, take the lead on, on the first uh, topic, which you uh, <laughs> which you, which you um, named Happy New Year. I'm not entirely sure what what to put in that, but uh, I'll let you lead on this one. Well, I always sort of say Happy New Year because January is the uh, period where we finally get all of the predictions. It did mostly in December, but we have all the predictions from all the Wall Street brokerage firms, everybody who makes, makes, and all the money managers make predictions for the year 2024. And what's the lesson that we have to take away from this is that most predictions by the end of this year are going to be wrong. So, uh, they're probably already wrong in some uh, cases or after the first month. So you have to really sort of say that don't follow a lot of predictions, follow the market prices. And that's been the, the essence of what we've been talking about for a very long time. This is that prices are primal. You're going to get a lot of information out of prices that is probably more useful than what you're going to get from, you know, the predictions that many uh, firms make. Now, it's very interesting when we tie this together with one thing I always look at every year is the uh, World Economic Forum uh, does a risk survey and they present their annual risk survey, you know, at the end of the year. And it's assessment, a survey of what the, what the key risks in, uh, you know, two years, 10 years. So, uh, so but they do some tremendous visuals and gra- graphics. They're not making predictions per se, but saying from survey, this is what's important to, to many risk managers or what people sort of say are risks. And interestingly, you say, what do you think is the number one risk that uh, people assess in the World Economic Forums from their survey? Now, this is a very unique group of individuals, but we say, you know, I'll just throw this out. What do you think is the is the number one risk that they th- think is out there for the next two years? Yeah. I mean, at the risk of being completely wrong here, Mark, when you put me uh, on the spot like this, of course, it would seem to me natural that perhaps geopolitical risk would be uh, high up on the agenda. I'm not sure whether that's true or whether it is the most. Uh, but I have a feeling with a question like that that it that I'm I'm not I'm not in the right spot here. <laughs> that's a good answer, and it is in the top ten. And but you know, when when I ask a question like that, you of course know that it's going to be a leading question. <laughs> And uh, that is probably going to be a little unusual, but the but the number one risk that people view is misinformation or disinformation, which is a very interesting uh, number because you say like, how is misinformation going to be the number one risk that we face over the next two years? So um, I could see why you're exclude that, but then let's take that what that means for uh, 
for any type of quantitative systematic managers. Well, if misinformation and disinformation are number one issues, well, then you have to say like, well, what is the information you're using in any model? And how likely is that information uh, distorted either for the collection or revisions or other issues? Perfect example is, is that which has been a, a meme that we've been seeing throughout uh, you know, the macro world is, is that you look at a lot of the employment m- numbers in the U.S. This is that generally it's been up around 200,000 you know, jo- jobs per month. But we see that there's been a lot of revisions in past numbers lower so that we're seeing that, the, that constantly we have a new number that comes out, old numbers are revised down. New number comes out, old numbers are revised down. If that's the case, then what we're seeing a situation is, is that, you know, the employment number may, you know, that people might react in the very short run, but it may not be a good piece of information to use in a, in a model. So then you sort of say, well, what is the data that you can use in a model that is going to be most effective? And this gets back to an, uh, the issue of why so many quants focus in on price data. That's the one that's, uh, that's, that's most important because it's determined in the marketplace by dollar votes. It's subject to revision in the sense is that markets can change, but in reality, that's the price that clears the market at a given point in time. And so that's the reason why systematic managers are so focused on price, because there is a potential problem with disinformation. Interestingly, in the, in the top 10 list in this World Economic Forum is, is, is that uh, number seven, I think, came out to, uh, was uh, uh, inflation. And then, you know, also in the top 10 was uh, economic slowdown. But of the top 10 risks, not a, uh, only two were macro related. Others were related to climate change, misinformation, geopolitical culture change. So this is a, one type of survey. But it's interesting that it's not that the biggest risks that we face globally f- are not in the economic sphere, but in, and we'll call it non economic. And because of that, that's going to have a much bigger impact on, on prices in the sense is, is that there may not be a direct link between what might happen with these risks and what will happen in a given market price. So if we have cultural change, how, how is that going to be manifested in price? We don't know. No, I think, I mean, I think it's super important. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm kind of surprised and then I'm not surprised when I, when I hear it, um, a couple of things springs to mind. Um, one is of course that I completely agree, of course, that, uh, price and, and I think, uh, that's really what our industry is, is built on is this core belief that price will uh, you know, have all the information uh, in it, uh, and it's the only true um, kind of information that that's out there. But what I also see in our world is that some managers have kind of moved away from price uh, and started to incorporate other things. I mean, we spoke with uh, AQR last year, and they talk about economic trend, which is not based on price. And uh, we know, quote unquote, that there's been a number of systematic global macro managers out there where it's not price per se that drives uh, their signals, even though they are quote unquote systematic. So I find that quite interesting. Um, the other thing that springs to mind, but this is maybe uh, a little bit too political to say, but it's interesting that the World Economic Forum says misinformation because I'm sure there's lots of people out there that would say, well, uh, maybe they are one of the sources of misinformation or at least driving a certain agenda. Uh, so, um, so I find that fascinating <laughs> that that came out. Um, well, that's when you get down to this forecast and when you talk about the, and then we tie this all together is, is that systematic managers generally believe that prices is the driver. So, and then there's a spectrum of managers. So the one spectrum would say, I only use price. The other spectrum is it would say that, well, let's use other information. And in, in my view is, is, is that that other information might give us good information about what might happen to price. Now, the link is not always clear, but it might give us an idea of where they're going to be, where, what we call change points. That could be on the macro basis. It all could be more on a micro basis. But we'll sort of say, 
uh, the Holy Grail is to say, is there other information that can give us an idea of whether trends are going to be re, uh, that reinforce trend behavior or reinforce the market direction? A perfect example is, is that, okay, if inflation is, is going down, that should be a reinforcer and telling us what might happen to other prices in, in the markets, that there's a feedback loop between the two. Is there going to be a slowdown in economic growth or is there going to be higher growth? That's also going to have a key impact. It's going to be a, a major factor, feature, or component in what might happen with prices. Now, the big problem comes in is, is that sometimes we find this is that the price relationships are not always causal from the fundamentals to back to uh, prices. Perfect example, some research has been done on the PMI recently, the Purchasing Managers Index, which is, a, is one of the key surveys. And as a survey, it, it's not subject to revisions. What they find is, is that sometimes it may be causally leading and sometimes it's lagging relative to prices. And that's what the problem comes in when you use fundamental information. Prices may be lead fundamentals. Sometimes fundamentals will lead prices. And that's the, the, the problem that you face if you want to try to be a uh, macro systematic manager. Yeah. I mean, the way I think about it, Mark, is that um, as soon as we leave price as the only input in our, in our models, we move into the world of prediction, in my opinion. Um, now, some people will say, well, trend followers kind of predict by having a you know, signal one way or the other, but we don't really, we just follow the data. But I think as soon as you try and move uh, and use other t um, data sources um, like inflation, well, you're going to have to make a prediction uh, on what you think that's going to do to the asset uh, or market that you trade. So I think there's a big, quote unquote, uh, no-no in, in some sense, uh, if you want to be sort of mechanical, rules-based, uh, like I would say most trend followers uh, are, I think uh, you, you kind of have to stick with just price as your input. Or put differently, is there a difference between prediction and observation? So a prediction will say, this is what I expect to happen in the future. An observation will say, this is what is happening today. And that could be that price is above a moving average. Okay. Is that a prediction? Well, you, you make a prediction because you assume that that will continue, but it's really an observation from that observation. What, what action do I take? All right. Well, then I'm going to let you introduce the next topic, which is uh, fascinating, uh, especially if you're into the trend following world as, uh, as, as we are. Uh, I think you, um, you found some really interesting research from uh, some of our good friends um, in another part of Switzerland. Uh, named Quantica. Quantica Capital actually did a video in, in this last month, and they were explaining some of their observations for 2023. Uh, but embedded in their you know review of 2023 was some actually some very good research, and it's good to sort of reinforce some fundamentals with with strong research, because you could talk about sort of conclusions, what you think about trend followers, it's great to have some of the data backed up with, uh, or the uh, observations backed up, backed up with data to give us a, a clear insights. So I'll start out with what some of the simple insights that they make that we probably know fairly well. And then what I think is very innovative. One is, is that they looked at the uh, attribution of trend lengths, you know, varies uh, through time. Okay, I think we knew that. So speed of trend. Speed of trend. And so the speed of trend, we'll say that intermediate trend followers are still, that, that's the best. That's, that's the sweet spot. And so, and I think that that's probably where we see the majority of money managed. If you go very fast, very short term, trend following is not as effective. And it's probably because it's more driven than in the short run by price pressure, EDO effects, inventory shocks. So we'll pro say that short-term trends or very fast trends, you know, do exist, but they're also subject to strong reversals. And so fast trends by itself may not uh, be very effective. Intermediate trends look very well, uh, do very well. And what they found actually for this year, 2023 or the last year, was is that 
you did well if you took a very, very long-term trend approach. So uh, much longer than what the intermediate w would sort of say. And so they say, look, at any given year, what you're trying to do as a trend follower is to say, I want to try to find a sweet spot of where trends are, but that sweet spot may change from year to year. So I think we knew that already, but I think it reinforces the idea that intermediate trend followers are still the best. But if let's say that there's a performance in a given year is, is, is not as good as on average, it could be because the sweet spot of trends was either longer or shorter. 2023 in the case, it was probably better to be a longer term, term trend follower, much longer than, than the traditional intermediate. Yeah. So what they did, in fact, was they basically went back to 2000, year 2000, and looked at, you know, over that 23 year period, you know, what would have been kind of the quote unquote uh, optimal or sweet spot in terms of look back uh, period uh, for a uh, trend model um, that they run. Uh, yeah. And uh, not, not their own trend model, but like something that represents the industry. And as you say, they found that this sort of medium term, one to two quarters, uh, is, is an interesting time frame. Um, and that kind of makes uh, sense. I think, I think that's, uh, as you say, that's probably something we, we all notice. And then you go on and you uh, correctly uh, explain that they found that 2023 was very different. And, in, and according to them, uh, they found that you, if you were super slow, I mean, like three year look back or something like that, you would have done uh, significantly better. But they also say, well, it's not really trend following if you have a three year look look back because you almost just become like long only uh, type uh, strategy. But what I wanted to mention is that we do something slightly different. Um, we look on calendar year by year and we use a generic trend model. Again, not one of our own, but close. And we see what different look back periods will make. And actually, we found that it was the opposite last year. That actually the best look back period last year was short. A short uh, look back period, something like 40 days or something like that. So I was quite, um, so it's quite fascinating. So there are obviously methodologies in these and that types of analysis does uh, make a difference um, because they found that you had to be very super long. And we found, um, and I think we look up until 300 day look back, that we found that, um, you know, anything above 100 days didn't make money. And, uh, and actually the only few timeframes that would have made money last year would have been around 40 days. Now, the preference of this is, of course, that it's based on the markets that we have in our, in the portfolio that we look at, which are fewer markets than what they look at. And that can actually obviously have a meaningful impact. Um, so I just want to make that comment that, that we found something slightly different, but I do like the analysis they did, I have to say. Well, that's the reason why we constantly have these studies done over and over again, because, you know, you you change some of the underlying assumptions, you change the time period you look at, and you make it very different answers. So the one thing I think that uh, that overall is, is that what we find is, is that there's no single point when you talk about trend following or any type of quant model. You say, uh, even if, let's say, you're looking at risk premiums or risk factors, you know, how you measure momentum, how you measure, you know, quality, how you me measure value can be very different from one manager to another. So, so people, two managers could be quantitative value managers where they sort according to the, let's say, a list of 500 stocks looking for the value premium. Usually what happens, you want to buy the top decile and sell the, sell the bottom decile. But how you measure value can be very different between one manager and the next. And you're going to get very different results. So, you, so I think that everyone has to appreciate the fact that modeling is, uh, can have personality. And I sort of half joke that every systematic manager has personality. And so you have to sort of disentangle what is the personality of the manager. Well, one could be, so to say, one personality could be, say, like, I'm only going to be a long-term trend follower, and that's what I do. So I just focus in that one area. Another personality could be, say, like, well, 
since I know that that, you know, you know, key spot of where you're going to make the most money in trend following can vary from year to year. I'm going to include intermediate, long-term, and maybe short-term. So that would be another personality. So you have to appreciate that, that each model, a modeler or each firm might have a different personality in how they approach these problems. And we'll say having multiple trend periods is a way to diversify. And so in some sense, this is that, 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 that is a one personality. I'm going to be more risk averse, going to diversify over different trend, uh, trend parameters. Yeah. And it's actually what's also uh, interesting about uh, the fact that we kind of came to uh, different conclusions for last year is the fact that I think for, for a long time, I think many people thought of trend followers as being kind of just kind of more or less the same. And if you want exposure to trend following, you just need to find one trend follower and, and you'll be fine. But in the last few years, and maybe this is partly because there's been uh, more innovation, if I can use that word, meaning some people have introduced other things than trend into their models. People have gone, uh, you know, into alternative markets, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but actually the uh, uh, dispersion uh, among manager returns uh, and also last year, uh, and, and even in, in the month of January, we're going to see some, some dispersion without a doubt. Um, so I think you're right that um, we, we do have a little bit of personality, even though we're systematic. I think that's a good way of describing it. That's the challenge for investors because when you, you, I know you're at a conference in, down in uh, Miami, and so there's probably lots of allocators there. And one of the challenges that they have is they say like, well, when I build a portfolio, I sort of say, I want to get trend following exposure. Well, can you do it with just one manager? You could try, but give it its personality that may not be what you need. You may need more than one manager, I mean two managers. And then we'll sort of say, well, the constant battle that we've been seeing across years on the, this podcast and others about trend following is, is what does it mean to be pure trend following versus trend following plus something else? So all of these are tied up with the personality and all of them are trying to address the issue is that there's no single, uh, there's no single approach or single time frame that will work at all times. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then again, Mark, you can say that I think that's true. And I do think that, you know, if you're a big institution and you want exposure to trend following, you should probably pick two or three managers. I think you'll, you'll get, uh, far with, with just a, a few number. But at the same time, I think you could say that, well, if I just pick one manager, but I stay with the manager long enough, you probably tend to get a return stream um, that is not vastly different in the long run from, say, what you find among the you know, top 10, 15, 20 uh, managers who've been around for a long time. I think that that's the important part. It's uh, that it's people that's been around for a long time. Um, so, uh, so it is quite fascinating. Um, and of course we always know that in the short term, things can be very different, uh, with so many things, uh, in, in life. Um, and I think that, yes, as the, uh, as the time horizon that you hold an investment increases, then we'll sort of see that the, uh, dispersion across managers will start to dissipate. And so, so you, you have lots of dispersion across managers over any short horizon. But if you look at three, five, ten years, then that that difference will start to to, to move to uh, to what we'll call the core uh, strategy return. Yeah. So what else no, do we uh, agree. What else do we learn? I think that, uh, and and again, this is something we already know. But if you uh, rank order all the performance of the markets you trade, what you usually find is is that you're your, your winners, both on the long and short side, are often concentrated in a few names. So trend following, I think the rank ordering of, of uh, returns across assets may be different than what we'll see in other hedge fund strategies. Let's so say here what you're going to say that uh, you have, if you might have a hit rate or a success rate that's below 50%, but what you find is, is that some of the markets that you trade, you have very large slugging percentages, and that would be the amount of percentage that you make in, uh, on your winners relative to, to losers. So, so you'll make some very large gains in just a few markets to make up your performance for the year. 
when you think about uh, more traditional hedge funds, or if, let's say that, that we're looking at cross-sectional s- stocks, or those that are looking f- uh, for you know, risk premiums, there's the expectation that there's going to be a, a little bit more smoother returns that you're going to get, uh, that you're looking at the hit rate that's going to try to be successful across the larger number of assets. So that's one of the return profiles that you're going to see are very different for trend followers than what you're going to find for other hedge funds, quant, hedge fund strategies. What Quantica did, what they call us, is they said like, well, we can divide up our our return our returns into you into you know no, the number of principal components. Okay, they have a specific way in which they do that. What you say you say that and you say that there could be a number of of components or a number of factors that can explain return. We don't know what the actual component is, but we say you know there are uh, more explanatory factors or fewer. And usually when you do principal components, your first two principal components, you know, uh, sort of generate most or can explain most of the return. Now, interestingly, what they find is, is that as the number of, if for a given time period, if the number of you know, principal components or factors that are associated with a given year, as that gets larger and larger or more, that returns actually go down. So that when, you know, a given year's performance can be explained by one or two factors, returns for trend following is going to be much, much greater. Now, it makes sense. This is that if there are large single drivers of return in a given year, let's say 2022 was a race, then you're going to sort of see that, that trend followers are going to do better. If let's say that there are a lot of factors that are driving returns in a given year, then usually there's uh, trend followers are going to do worse, which is very interesting. So you say like, what we really want to have for a good year for a trend following strategy is to have sort of just a few factors driving performance or driving markets. Okay. Uh, Now, on one hand, is it that you don't want to have a single factor driving performance over a very short period, let's say like March, 2020, but if you have a large move in interest rates, large move in currencies, large move in equities that sort of dominate other markets, that that's usually going to lead to better trend following per- performance. So, so I think that the, this is this is uh, really important. Is is that uh, in some sense you trade more markets, but in reality your best returns come when there's only a few factors that are driving performance in a given year. So. Uh, so, so I want to I want to dig into that a little bit, Mark, um, just to improve my own uh, understanding of principal component analysis here. The example that they bring up is that uh, in 2022 uh, there were very few factors, and it was kind of very concentrated about uh, around interest rates. And of course, you can say that there was a lot of conviction, a lot of risk taking in interest rates in 2022. Um, that certainly gave uh, managers uh, some very, very strong uh, returns. There were other sectors that made money, but clearly fixed income was uh, the driving force. So in a sense, that kind of makes sense. And uh, I I think we've talked about this in the past, that uh, on one side, we want to be diversified (laughs) and uh, and kind of limit our risk. But on the other hand, when trend flows really make money is often when we have "Quote unquote conviction in our portfolio uh, and, and a higher level of of risk taking, and I think that's I think most people will understand that example from 2022. But if we take a year like 2020, I guess it was with COVID, and there were some very strong uh, moves in markets, certainly in the first uh, part of that year. How do you determine what the principal component?" is in a period like that because the underlying cause i mean with the with interest in in 2022 is easy i mean the fed was raising interest rates so it is there's a very natural uh, linear relationship but when something like covid happens where you know a, a number of things are impacted how do you how do you how do you put that in perspective so to speak right well what principal components is trying to we'll call it decompose the, the, the risk into a number of different f- factors. 
And so it's not saying what are those factors. It's not saying that there is a specific phenomena that was occurring. They're just sort of saying is that if I try to decompose a uh, uh, or reduce the dimensionality you know, of a return series, here's the number of uh, factors that I need to to explain the volatility. So, uh, so that doesn't mean if we have a single factor, let's say a pan, uh, pandemic or COVID, that you're going to make money. Well, so sort of saying this is that that was one of the uh, that there was a single driver. We may not know what it is, and you know, with the principal components that were that can explain the returns for a given time horizon. Then we as the, as investors have to then say, well, what was that single factor that uh, that we think represented that first principal component? In 2022, we think that it's uh, uh, we think that it was COVID and it was COVID related. Now, what well, we could say we could have a single driver that had very strong impact on 2020, but it may have been over just a very short horizon. So. In that particular case, is uh, March was a very difficult period. If let's say that you were a shorter term trend follower, in, in some sense you were able to get your positions to change really quickly during the crisis. If you're a longer term trend follower, you may have got a little bit whipsawed in 2020. So this goes back to the first issue: is this is that that on any given period of time, the length of trend that's uh, will generate the highest returns will differ from one period to the next. But the really interesting part, if I, if I can go on about to this particular piece of research, is, is that, so if you say that you do better when there's only a, you know, fewer factors that are driving returns in a given year, so, and, in a, you know, simplifying a lot, then that would sort of suggest, it's like, well, I don't need to trade as many markets. This is that I should trade less markets. So that's, that would seem like the natural conclusion that you'd have. Well, what they did is, is that they looked at, you know, some representative, uh, you know, trend following, and we'll sort of say is the simple model. And they said, let's look at a trend follower who trades X number of markets, and then we'll do one that has more markets, and then one that has the maximum markets, maybe, you know, more than, uh, you know, like 150 plus. So so we could, we could actually look at the, run the experiment and say like, well, let's look at different, uh, you know, size of trading bundles for the trend follower and see how do they do. And, you know, I think the initial assumption would be is that if, uh, if returns are, are, are highest when there's only a single or a few factors, well, then trade fewer markets and you'll do better. What they found is, is that that's not exactly the case, is, is that you will do better if you trade more markets even if there is a fewer factors that are driving and principal components driving returns in a given period of time. So it argues that you should maximize diversification at all times with the number of markets. Then they said this is that, well, let's assume that we look at that a given period of time where there are more markets explaining a return in a given uh, quarter or given time period. Well, generally the market that, uh, or the trend follower portfolio that trades more markets will do better. So in some sense, if you trade less and we are in a year where there's more uh, uh, factors to explain performance or a given period of time, to, to, there are more factors that explain performance that actually being diversified will actually do much better. So what that tells you is, is it gives us a new nuance on how to think about diversification. So generally, is, is it that the argument is, is that uh, I want to be diversified because I can reduce risk because I'm going to spread my bets over a larger number of markets. What their study is showing us is slightly different interpretation. Is, is that like, I want to be diversified across more markets because if there are more factors that are driving returns in any given period, well, then there's more likelihood that I could capture those factors, albeit I don't know what they are, than if I trade fewer markets. So in general, this is, is that there's a defensive reason for diversification. I want to sp or spread my risk. But then there's more of also, you know, I don't want to say offensive, uh, but I'll use that term, is that you can exploit uh, more factors if you trade more markets. So this would argue is, is that if possible, 
all things equal. This is it. You got to control for, you know, trading costs and others. This is it. Trading more markets should be better than trading less markets in a trend following model. I, I hear that and I hear the theory and, and, uh, you know, uh, the analysis is obviously, uh, uh, very convincing, but then I just start looking at numbers and then I start looking at the managers that I know trade hundreds of markets and the managers that I know trade fewer markets. And, uh, and frankly, in the last few years, managers with that trades fewer markets have done uh, better. Now I haven't sat down and done kind of long-term uh, performance, but just from recollection and having observed uh, returns uh, over a long period of time, which actually also goes to the point about that I mentioned before that if you look at individual managers over a long period of time and you adjust for volatility and so on and so forth, they're not vastly different. And of course, we know that some managers started trading, um, you know, lots more markets. Certainly, I would say 10 to 15 years ago, uh, there's been a, 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 a higher interest in doing so in, in recent years, but some of them have been doing it for a while. And again, when I look at those managers' returns, I simply don't see the evidence for these conclusions uh, that trading more markets produces better returns. It produces different returns, but I don't see them as being better. And maybe one day if someone listening to us actually had the time to go and do the analysis of, of manager returns and group them in those who trade, you know, 150 markets or more or 100 markets or more and those who trade less than 100 markets could be very interesting to see what the findings really are. I'm just talking from memory, so I can't be 100% sure. Um, but I don't think I'm far off, uh, frankly, despite this analysis that they have come up with. Well, any analysis isn't uh, definitive, but it does give us a sort of, uh, you know, it gives us insight that we may not have had before that may cause us to sort of say like, hmm, should I change my underlying assumptions? Is there something I should look back and try to analyze a little bit more uh, in detail to try to answer this question? So, uh, so the, the battle of how many markets you trade have been going on for years. So some will say like, look, we trade fewer markets, transactions cost are less. You know, I want, I'm just trying to pick up the major trends. You know, I'm not going to get a lot of value from a lot of these smaller markets anyway. So it's especially if a, at some point is, is that if I'm, if I'm trading less than a 1% move on, in, you know, or a 1% allocation that it's going to have, a, you know, very, you know, little impact on the return overall. So, uh, this is saying this, is that like, well, if you were in a more idiosyncratic market where there's a lot of, you know, diverse shocks or diverse factors driving returns. You want to trade more markets. Okay. It makes sense. Uh, I think they say that uh, also is that if there are less factors, but you trade more markets, you still do better. So that's what I find sort of intriguing. So if you sort of say that, well, if we're in a more idiosyncratic market, that trading more markets should do better. Okay. That seems to make intuitive sense. But if we're more in a, you know, uh, we'll say a limited number or single factor market like 2022, then I'd expect that more concentrated or a CTA to trades manage, uh, trend follower trades, fewer markets will do better. That's not the case. So that's the one that's really counterintuitive. So, so I think that this opens up some interesting, uh, research agenda of, well, what is really going on and, uh, what is this uh, telling us and uh, how do we sort of look at markets? So. Uh, so, so I think that, uh, that's where this is a, an important piece of research. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I think it is a very important, um, piece and as, as a non-quant, maybe, uh, my, my, uh, simple observation would be maybe it's not the number of markets. That's the most important thing. It's actually two other things, namely which markets and will you be able to trade them in meaningful size, meaning that you can treat them equal so that, uh, so, so in my own opinion, I think that trading more markets up to a certain point makes sense, but 
But I think once you get above that, and whether that's 100 markets or wherever the number is, I just don't see uh, the big difference. And actually, we're going to be talking to a manager on the podcast that uh, uh, Moritz spoke to that's coming out very soon um, that trades even fewer markets than some of the managers that I've come across now, albeit they're a smaller manager, but um, but have had very good experience with trading even fewer markets. So um, I guess it's uh, it's a topic that we'll continue to revisit, and I think it's uh, it's it's super interesting uh, actually. But let's do let's round it off because they did a little bit more work in their in their review uh, of last year that I also thought was was very relevant and and interesting. This is, you know, and uh, this gets back to diversification, and and I think it just as a final comment on our last discussion is is that you know as an economist you always have to think on the margin. So so yes, yeah, so what's the marginal effect of adding the next market, and is it useful or not? Which is always the que- question that you want to ask us. Is that and when you're when you're building a portfolio, but in terms of marginal of value and in, in terms of trend following, we also sort of looked at. Uh, a very simple analysis that I think is is very fruitful is that let's look at uh, you know traditionally over the last you know decade or two is is that you look at the correlation between equity and bonds equities go up bonds go down and so what happens you get this natural diversification and so often people would build the 60 40 stock bond portfolio because of this diversification benefit and in some sense, some would argue that you don't need as much trend following, you don't need trend following because you get this natural diversification from bonds and bonds will still give you cash cash flow. So what's the purpose of, of tr- uh, trend following or what's the purpose of any type of uh, alternative investment you know, in that world? What they find is, is that if the correlation between equity and bonds goes up, which implicitly is saying this, is that diversification in traditional assets goes down. Then the value of trend following goes up, okay? Because it's going to be a more unique type of uh, of asset to hold. So this is something that we've talked about before, is, is that when you think of diversification, diversification can come in many different forms. The traditional view is that we always look at market diversification. Hold stocks, hold bonds, I'm diversified hold, you know, uh, maybe global equities, hold some, uh, uh, you know, other assets, maybe real estate or something else. Uh, That's market diversification. Well, the next diversification you could think of is style diversification. Style could be trend following versus non-trend following or some other alt-risk premium style. And then the third diversification is timing. Okay. Is this is that if you if you're looking within, you know, some quant strategies, do I have fast models versus slow models? But I think the important point that they come up with is, is that styled diversification can be a good substitute to market diversification. If there is less market diversification because correlations across assets are going up, then style diversification will be more valuable and will be more important for your portfolio. Yeah, no, I think that that's a really important point. And I think intuitively we've all known it, but I think it's important that we talk more about it actually with the uh, clients and potential clients. Uh, I think it's a super interesting point. And also I think when, when it comes to correlation, and I, um, uh, I think also they make the point, and that is, of course, that correlation between stocks and bonds um, seem to be changing with changes to inflation. And once you get to sort of these, sort of, I don't know what number they have, but from other analysis that I've seen, once you get to inflation rates around 3%, you tend to find historically, uh, even going back more than 100 years, that that's, those are the periods where um, stocks and bonds will be positively correlated, as we've seen uh, in recent years, but actually um, that you also have seen for uh, decades, actually, uh, uh, it, it, during the... Uh, mid 1900s where generally the correlation was positive for long periods of time um and so i think you know if people believe that perhaps this extreme carry regime that we saw from year 2000 to 2019 uh is over and that quote unquote deglobalization will lead to higher costs higher inflation then actually their analysis points to the fact that then trend following becomes an even more important part of of a portfolio because of this, quote, perhaps more permanent change in the relationship between equities and bonds. Right. 
in some senses that the buzzword we want to have is think of style diversification as another way to look at building portfolios. Yeah, no, it was a great, um, great webcast they did, uh, Quantica, so uh, kudos to that. Uh, I actually saw Bruno over here a couple of days ago, so, um, so, uh, so yeah. I think we have maybe room for one more or time for just one more of the many topics that you listed, um, because there was a paper out also from another good company and friend of, our, of the podcast, namely uh, Man HL, uh, also related to uh, trend following. Um, and uh, I think this was about how trend following would perform um, or how it would generally do in both hiking and cutting cycles. So back to the Fed a bit here. Can you sum it up how what the, what the findings were? Well, the general view has been is, is that like, well, the trend followers, they only do, uh, they only make money because interest rates were going down and it was a long-term trend for decades. And so, so, uh, so in some sense is that yeah, they're not going to make money if, uh, if rates uh, if rates go up. And so with Man AHL, with their, the Man Institute, what they did is, is they look at trend following. They say, let's let's look at when the Fed is uh, raising rates, when they're dropping rates. Can we both make money in both periods? And the answer is yes. And so I think it in general is, is that what we find is, is that in a rising rate environment is that the market can be more challenging and no different. And I think that what we find in general for trend following and for a lot of strategies is that trading on the short side can be, you know, much more difficult. But what they did when they looked at sort of a, a trend following across different interest rate regimes that it can work both at, at, and under both environments, which I think is important for people to realize this is that to now 2024 might be a period where we're going to have it in the uh, environment where we could be able to face both rising and lowering interest rates. Right now, the Fed is probably anticipating, uh, well, the market is anticipating that uh, we would be down about 75 basis points in, by July, about 130 basis points by the end of the year. But we'll sort of say that that's market expectations. Fed has told us is that don't get ahead of yourselves. And so in some sense is that we could have a big reversal in rates. So, so I think that that's going to be the challenge for 2024 in the fixed income side. And I think that the same challenges exist in, in equities is, is, is that we've hit all times highs in equities. Now, surprisingly, is, is that from the last time we hit a high with the S&P 500, we're 500 basis points higher. Real rates are, are strongly positive. So even though we're in a higher rate environment, a higher real rate environment, the market is at all time highs. And what you see in particular is this is that the S and P is doing well, but you know the Russell two thousand is still in a uh, bear mar market. So so there are strong differences within the equity market right now that gi giving mix mixed signals. And with that, I probably would sort of say, <laughs> I was going to say is is that. The final thing that you have is, is that markets can get stretched. And I think one of the things that uh, we see is, is that uh, uh, we've looked at, did some investigation because it came on, on our radar, is, is that the, the commitment of, of traders specifically for equities. And in that particular case, what we found is, is that uh, a lot of people said like, well, if you look at the uh, net asset management positions, they're strongly long. They're at all-time highs, especially if you, you know, dollarize it. Uh, same with the QQ, uh, QQQs and the NASDAQ in the futures. And so what, uh, And so they're saying is that the market is topped. When you see these stretched environments, we find that, that that call was probably at the end of the year in early in January. And then you look at the actual uh, market events is the market has still gone higher, even though that, uh, you know, the commitment of traders might suggest that there's an extreme. So markets and trends will often last much longer than expected. Yeah. And I, you know, obviously when, when you do analysis like this and you look at periods of, of, of rate, uh, rates coming down and periods of rate going up, rates going up, I mean, obviously we don't have that many sample, uh, we don't have a massive sample uh, size for, for doing this. Um, and I will also say that I think in terms of the actual you know, is it going to be a good environment for trend following or, or a bad environment if interest rates goes up and down? I mean, a lot of it really has to do with the speed of which they move up or down. Um, so um, not just the direction. 
uh, I would say. But of course, Katie, uh, that I spoke to not long ago on the podcast, she's also done a lot of work on the on this, um, uh, especially focused on on the kind of the fixed income exposure of of trend following. So uh, it's definitely worth uh, paying paying attention to. Mark, I think we should just um, say you know thanks to Quantica and Man for producing some interesting research that we can talk about um, today. Next week, I will be joined by Andrew. He's back, and it'll be interesting to see what's the uh, what the last uh, couple of months have been in the world of replication and the beginning of this year uh, with the uh, market environment that we've been through. Um, if you have some questions to uh, uh, for Andrew, uh, please email them to info at toptradersonplug.com, and I'll do my best to make sure we get uh, those uh, covered. Of course, uh, you should check out the website where you find lots of uh, blog posts every week. And of course, the daily trend barometer, which is uh, worth paying attention to, I think. And also once a month, uh, Rich and I uh, produce a monthly trend following report that you can read uh, as well as signing up for the weekly uh, newsletter that we share. So from Mark and me, thanks ever so much for listening. We look forward to being back with you next week. And until next time, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.